Good morning, everyone. How's everybody feeling today? All right. Well, on behalf of uh, Collective Strategies, Social Equity LA, the Can uh, California Cannabis Coalition, Dope Magazine, and Ease, I want to welcome you to the inaugural State of Cannabis 2019 Legislative Update and B2B Expo here at the lovely Los Angeles Convention Center. Give yourselves a round of applause. I also want to thank all, our, our, all of you for being here, the partners, our speakers that you're going to hear from, um, the sponsors and the exhibitors that are next door uh, providing you know, different services all throughout the supply chain. Uh, today we have an amazing uh, collective effort. That's really what this is about. The State of Cannabis is about us coming together. You'll see I brought a couple of friends. You guys may know some of them that are here today uh, to be able to provide that information to you guys that's so critical. Uh, including our keynote speaker, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, our U.S. representative and author of Ending Federal Marijuana Prohibition Act, who you'll hear from uh, soon. So I'm going to try my best to get out the way and let the experts come up and talk. Uh, but overall, I just wanted to point out that, you know, this was today's about uh, being thoughtful and thorough in terms of bringing you guys the information that you that is needed right now to help you guys navigate the system as the cannabis uh, industry uh, continues to grow and you know we really want the marketplace to thrive as it should and the goal of, of the state of cannabis is simple it's bringing the people together with the decision makers and the businesses so that we're working together to uh, enable the marketplace not inhibit it right so with that um, I'll let you guys uh, you know I'll let you guys enjoy the day, uh, but before I do that, um, without further ado, I want to uh, present you with your MC, the, the hostess with the mostess, uh, the queen of cannabis herself, uh, Cheryl Schumann, founder and CEO of Beverly Hills Cannabis Club. Please give her a round of applause. I just turned 59 uh, last week. I want to make sure that I've got my reading glasses on so I can actually do a good job up here. Hold on. So give me a, give me a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you. So um, a couple things I wanted to say first is I've been in the industry since 1992, started working in political and media strategy, and realized and woke up one day that our government lied to us. Shocking, I know. But then I started learning more about the devil's lettuce and realizing how many medicinal benefits it had. And then when I had cancer and it saved my life, that's when I decided to start a mission and become a pot evangelist. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> so... Um, a couple of things. During today, I'll be moderating, so I'm going to try to keep everyone on a really tight schedule. So a couple of things that, that I would like for you guys to do is have pen and paper or a computer or an iPhone or something because you're going to be catching a lot of information. Make sure you take people's information down, and I would like to ask the panel to make sure that you give your Twitter, your social media, or a website where people can follow up with you. Follow-up is really, really important. The other thing I want to tell you is the people in this room and this industry will never, ever be this small again. We are are still at the very beginning of this, especially in the United States, and even though it's grown globally, we have a chance to once again lead and make, really make America great again mm -hmm. by putting family farmers and people back to work and saving a few lives. So that being said, it is my honor and privilege. I'd like to also give a round of applause to the producers of this event and all the speakers that are donating their time and energy today. So please, a round of applause for all the people who got involved. So um, the first person I'd like to introduce is my new best friend, Peter Gigante, and he is with a company called Ease. How many people know about Ease? Please make a note of it. They are also one of our sponsors today. Let them know you're about your gratitude. And uh, Peter is the head of policy research at Ease. It's a technology platform that co connects adult consumers with local licensed retailers of cannabis for on-demand delivery of legal cannabis product. Their in uh, innovative software solutions give local cannabis businesses the tool that they need to build a legal and sustainable industry, while their robust compliance team helps keep everyone, retail and brand partners, in compliance with all local uh, regulations and state regulations. So it is with great honor that I introduce Peter to all of you and give him a round of applause and thank him. For Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, my name is Peter Gigante. I am the head of policy research at Ease. Uh, it's my great honor to keep abreast of what's happening in the cannabis industry uh, from academic research, industry research, 
um, also with think tanks, and also be able to leverage the data that we have and our consumer base to give some insights to our policymakers, to the industry, uh, really filling in knowledge gaps where we can to try to explain more about uh, the industry and its participants. And today I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, what we found in our latest report, which was released in January. Um, and it's just a look at who are our modern cannabis consumers are. We know that uh, there is a uh, still stigma to the industry that needs to be broken. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes from preconceptions about who consumers are and why they consume. So we're hoping that this data uh, really sheds some, some light on who they are and, and breaks through some of that, that stigma that I mentioned. Um, so just a little bit about Ease. I know it sounds like a lot of the people in the room are familiar with us. Uh, a lot of people would probably say that we're a delivery service. I would have to correct that and say that we are a technology platform that really are trying to support the legal industry uh, here in California. And very recently, we have just launched into the Portland, Oregon market. Uh, we work with local retailers and brands. Um, and we're also working with, so the consumers you know, have a, a standardized place to go for cannabis. They know that everything on the platform is tested, it's legal, it's licensed, uh, it's taxed appropriately. Um, and we're also working with policymakers and community groups to keep uh, the industry as healthy as, as possible. Um, I run our, our Ease Insights program, which is a research series uh, that looks at lots of industry issues. And as I mentioned, our latest report was the 2018 State of Cannabis. Uh, we have uh, transactional information from hundreds of thousands of consumers. Uh, we also have uh, supplemented those findings with a survey of about 4,000 of our uh, randomized sample of consumers as well to try to fill in the gaps of not just what are they buying, but why, uh, what difference is it making in their lives, and what uh, you know, insight can we add to, to consumers. So I just wanted to walk you through some of the, the key findings we found from this year, which is you know, there's a growing uh, inclusivity and diversity to the consumer base. Uh, legalization, 2018, banner year for California, really welcoming people into the space. Uh, let's, we saw first time consumers growing by 140%. Um, in that, baby boomers and uh, women growing quite fast as well. Uh, I think there's still overwhelmingly this idea that you know, cannabis is a young, college stoner kind of kind of vibe and it's actually it's really for everybody for different purposes um we saw and especially with the women there has been a consistent three percent year over year growth in their market share uh and so we're expecting that within the next three years you're going to see equal representation of female consumers in the marketplace and so brands and product manufacturers and retailers have to keep that in mind uh that there's there's going to be uh, more emphasis on bringing women into into the marketplace just to take a look at what, what category sales we saw, um, flower at 2018, given the regulatory inconsistency, it's a little hard to, to tease out uh, absolute you know, sort of, uh, insights, but we have found still that two thirds of the products purchased really were not flower. Uh, they were products that really don't require any paraphernalia at all. And I think that leads it uh, back into, again, the, this novice consumer. There's a lot of people who are approaching the legal market for the first time, uh, and they're finding that there's uh, much more convenient, mess-free, discreet product lines that are really appealing to them. Uh, also within these key findings, CBD. I mean, I think everyone in this room is probably well aware of the, the trend of CBD. It seems to be everywhere and in everything. Um, but it is driving a new demographic of consumers as well. We saw uh, CBD dominant or CBD only products were growing. Uh, the percentage of our, our consumers grew from 2.6% to 4.8%, so almost double. Uh, it is still a small, portion of the overall uh, consumer base, but we see this as like, a strong growth that there's a lot of interest from new consumers into CBD and how can that help me. And I think it's probably good for the industry uh, as an entry point, uh, giving them a safe space to, to learn about cannabis and where it comes from and CBD. Uh, and then hopefully that'll expose them further to uh, all the parts of the plant and, and the ways that it can help them. Um, we saw this specifically with the baby boomer population coming back to cannabis for some of them, first time discovery for others. Uh, and finding that uh, female baby boomers made up almost 30% of those customers that were coming in looking at CBD products. Um, so this, you know, for those who are interested in sort of you know, CBD lines of products, uh, that's gonna be an important demographic for you as well. And we saw uh, products used for a variety, cannabis in general, not just CBD, but being used for a variety of wellness applications. Uh, and we see this, you know, I think this fits very well with what we've heard in the past from our veteran community, uh, that there is a substitution effect uh, for consumers, you know, being able to reduce or stop pain medications over the counter and prescription, and, and also seeing a reduction in alcohol and tobacco consumption as well. 
So to the extent that cannabis is helping people achieve their goals uh, regarding other substances, we think that's, that's good news. Um, again, just a little bit more graphics of consumers on CBD, 29% uh, of consumers being female boomers, as I mentioned. Um, and you know, we see, if you're looking generationally at who is driving the CBD surge, again, it's boomers uh, consistently. We did also ask in the survey about, are people feeling anything? This is one of the big questions of, is CBD just snake oil? Are people just wasting their money and not finding any relief from it? Uh, and overwhelmingly, we saw, yes, that there are uh, a range of, of, of reported experiences, relaxation being number one, uh, but also pain relief, stress relief, and anxiety relief. Uh, so we're hoping that this will help illustrate that if you are actually taking CBD, uh, which we know that from the products on our pro platform that they are you know, tested, uh, and, and then we know how, how concentrated they are, that people are actually finding relief from CBD. Um, also looking at where are people consuming, why are they consuming? We see this overwhelmingly for wellness trends, uh, sleep and personal care, sports and exercise. And even among men who I think there is still this idea that men are less interested in wellness, uh, over 50% you know, still cited personal care as a, as a use for cannabis. Um, so I think that this fits very well into uh, the growing trend of trying to discover what else can cannabis do for me. Um, some of that substitution effect in a little bit more detail, we saw millennials were most likely to report reducing or eliminating alcohol consumption in 2018. Uh, and interesting, our youngest generation, Gen Z, was the most likely to reduce or eliminate tobacco in 2018. I know for a lot of our uh, public health officials and policymakers, you know, getting teens off of tobacco is uh, really important. And a little bit more about uh, reduction of, of medications. We saw 71% overall reduced their dependence on over-the-counter medication, and over a third, 35% reduced their prescription medications. And we wanted to know, is this related? There's always going to be a portion of the population that says, no, I didn't actually feel anything. Uh, and we wanted to see, is this relating to dosing? Um, and so we looked at the responses from people who routinely took more than 40 milligrams as a high dose category, 11 to 40 milligrams as a medium dose, and under 10 for their low dose. And overall, everyone reported um, reduction in over-the-counter pain treatment, uh, but there was a, a correlation to, to the dosing. So to those who are trying low dose and saying, I'm not really feeling any effect, uh, it may just be that they're not taking enough of it. I also want to bring up, this is a, a little bit of a finding from our survey we did in uh, July of 2017, looking at the illicit market specifically. We have seen California struggle a little bit with tax revenues for a host of reasons. Uh, we wanted to try to understand why, so we, we messaged out to uh, California consumers in general, not specifically Ease, but also a cohort of Ease consumers, to figure out how do they go about the process of buying cannabis? What's important to them? What do they keep in mind when they're making these decisions? Uh, and we had found most people have some wellness application for cannabis. So when we gave them a range and says, do you consume only for medical or only for uh, adult use or for something in between, and you give them a range, most people pick something in that range. Um, so to those who would say, well, cannabis is just you know, kids wanting to get high, uh, the, the evidence suggests strongly otherwise. Um, what we did find is that most consumers are satisfied with the legal market, yet also purchasing from the illicit market. And beyond that, they're actually very satisfied with the purchases that they're making from the illicit market. So to the extent that we want to try to support our, our businesses that are being compliant and going with state regulations and local regulations, what learnings can we apply? How, do, how can the legal market compete with the illicit market? And there are certain factors that consumers very much like. They are in favor of testing. They like having quality products that are well labeled and safety tested. Uh, what they didn't like was high prices, and a lack of access. Access is just as important to them as pricing or, or testing. Uh, and this we've seen this recently in the California State Legislature. A bill was proposed to limit, uh, to extend local control over home delivery as well. So even in jurisdictions where uh, there would be no legal cannabis businesses licensed, they would also then have the ability to limit uh, home delivery as well. Uh, fortunately, that bill uh, did not make it past its first committee hearing, uh, so for this year it seems to be dead. But something to be aware of, uh, that you know, there's access is going to be an important part of consumer experience and consumer expectations. Uh, we've seen delivery being a very important part of a lot of other industries and well, and cannabis is really no exception. A lot of the learnings from this study was that um, consumers treat cannabis as they do any other consumer packaged good. 
Uh, they're concerned about quality and price and access. These are not unique things, but it's, a, it's reassurance that um, the normalization and destigmatization of cannabis is, is underway. Uh, so just a little bit of a, a trend to recap. Uh, again, first time consumers, up women, baby boomers, both growing segments. CBD does have effects, consumers are interested, and we're seeing a substitution effect for alcohol, tobacco, and pain medications. Um, and for 2019, uh, these are a little bit of sort of off-the-cuff predictions. I don't have a strong uh, data basis to, to prove these, but things that I'm seeing uh, more anecdotally, I think you're going to see a lot more cannabis-infused lifestyle. So certainly in food and beverage, uh, the National Re Restaurant Association report asked set chefs recently about what they expect to see, and food and beverage infusions was high on their list. Also in fitness and beauty regimens as well. Um, social consumption spaces, I mean, cannabis has always been a social activity for most people, uh, but now having recognized safe spaces to do that I think is going to be a growing trend. Um, and also CBD and everything. Obviously the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, making, changing the way that we treat hemp, uh, has led to hemp-derived CBD in, in most things, although there's a concern that uh, the safety and testing regimens around that probably need some, some tweaking to make sure that consumers are, are getting what they're paying for. Um, so that's, that's kind of where, you know, what, what we have to offer. Ease Insights, we're going to be working on these on a quarterly basis. There's uh, one coming up. I can tease it out for you that we're, we're tackling consumer sentiments around uh, impairment and specifically around impaired driving. Uh, so we're going to be excited to release that uh, in the near future. Um, I think, do we have time for questions? Do we have cap capability for questions? No. One minute. Huh? One minute. OK. <laughs> Oh, perfect. So in that case, uh, you could reach me at pgigante at ease.com. I'll be here all day. You can also find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Peter Gigante. There's not too many of us. Um, and I'm happy to, to answer questions after the fact as well. So thank you guys for your uh, attention. I appreciate it. And I hope you guys wrote down his information to contact him with any questions. And also, it'd be really nice because they are one of our sponsors. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> Blonde, old, and a cannabis consumer. Um, <laughs> but um, it would be really nice of you guys to give them a little shout out on the internet and say thank you, Ease, for, for actually uh, sponsoring the event. That would be really, really nice. That being said, I'm, I'm honored to uh, present the next speaker. That's Eric Gopel. He is the CEO of the Veterans Canvas Coalition, and this is very important because we all know that a lot of veterans are coming back with phantom limb pain as well as addictions to the opioid crisis, and that really is one of the biggest crises that we place, and, and Tulsi's going to address that later. Uh, in addition to that, uh, he is working with this non I'm sorry, he's the CEO of Veterans Cannabis Coalition, nonprofit advocacy group dedicated to ending cannabis prohibition and ensuring that the Department of Veterans and Affairs researches and develops cannabis-based medications. Please, a big round of applause for our next speaker, Eric. First off, thank you, Cheryl, and thank you to uh, Ryan Bacchus from the cannabis Co uh, California Cannabis Coalition, Luis Rivera from Collective Strategies, and Social Equity, LA, Ease, and Dope Magazine for sponsoring this event. My name is Eric Opel, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Veterans Cannabis Coalition. And I'll be providing an update for you all on uh, some of the major pieces of cannabis legislation currently working its way through Congress. So as Cheryl said, uh, the Can Veterans Cannabis Coalition is a nonprofit advocacy group, and our, our main goal is to end federal cannabis prohibition and ensure that the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, researches and develops cannabis-based medications. We do that through three basic lines of effort. Advocacy, where we work in DC, uh, you know, pushing for federal cannabis reform, excuse me, pushing for federal cannabis reform and research. We also engage in grassroots organizing, connecting veterans, the cannabis community, and other allies. And we work to destigmatize cannabis through informational outreach. As you can see on the uh, left-hand side, of the screen, some basic stats of what the veteran population is dealing with. Half of all veterans, these are VA numbers, by the way, half of all veterans suffering from chronic pain, 20% with PTSD, 20% with traumatic brain injuries. More than 100,000 dead veterans by suicide and overdose in the last 18 years. While we have spent upwards of, six, by some estimates, about four and a half trillion dollars on the combined costs of Iraq and Afghanistan, including uh, the veteran benefits that have gone along with that. And yet, those are our results. 
it was very frustrating uh, to, have, to be working in DC as a veteran um, and in my past position at the American Legion, uh, working on national security and developing their opioid, uh, their opioid epidemic response policies, to keep having to hear the same refrain over and over. There's not enough research, but we need alternatives to opioids, but there's not enough research. But anecdotally, observationally, clinically, you know, 25,000 plus studies on PubMed, there is enough research. And there is no research to justify the, the pharmaceutical protocols that the Department of Veterans Affairs has instituted, where a veteran, you know, with these very common conditions, ends up on eight to 12 medications a day. Some of them being opioids, some of them being benzodiazepines, but including sedatives, stimulants, uh, you know, anti-anxiety meds, antidepressants, antipsychotics, anti-seizure meds, right? You can, you can start to see how this pharmaceutical load, even in a healthy person, would drive, uh, you know, would drive most people to their, to their end. And veterans already dealing with complex and uh, co-occurring injuries are even more at risk because of that. So that brings me to one of the first pieces of legislation that we've endorsed. Um, and this was, endor this, uh, was introduced last year by Congressman uh, Lou Correa from Santa Ana. Uh, the VA Municipal Cannabis Research Act would essentially direct the veteran, Department of Veterans Affairs to conduct a very robust uh, cannabis research study looking at specifically at PTSD and pain. Um, the, one, of the, one of the good facets of this bill in particular is that it does not restrict either the, you know, the synthetic or natural nature of cannabis nor the ingestion method. Last year, the, when this bill was introduced, um, it, was, it was originally sponsored by the Republican chair, and to be honest, it was in a much more uh, you know, mild form. This year, much more directive, and certainly uh, carries a lot more teeth. We're excited to, you know, th this bill last year was, excuse me, this picture right there, uh, that was the hearing where the VA Medicinal Cannabis Research Act became the first cannabis standalone piece of cannabis legislation to pass out of congressional committee. That was last year. So this year, we have every expectation to see this move out of the House, and we have some relative uh, confidence that it will also move through the Senate. And I believe that this is going to be one of the two, one of the maybe two pieces of cannabis legislation that you will see passed into law uh, before, 20, before the end of 2020. Good. Thank you. Uh, the next piece of legislation that we're that we have been uh, that we have endorsed this year is the Veterans Medical Marijuana Safe Harbor Act. What this bill would do, and you know, feel free to consider this a little bit of a carve out specifically for for veterans, but it would essentially legalize uh, possession, transportation, and use uh, federally for veterans, or at least protect them from federal prosecution. Uh, there is a there is a massive issue um, with veterans dealing with the VA and being unable to honestly talk to their doctors about their cannabis use, or or you know uh, more often than not even be able to get any kind of relevant or accurate information from their doctors about cannabis. The endocannabinoid system is a bodily you know is a bodily system that has existed in humans you know for, I mean it exists in all mammals I believe uh, for hundreds of thousands millions of years. Um, and yet, most doctors in the United States and, and globally do not have any real understanding of it, right? And this is a, this is a system that impacts so many bodily, uh, bodily processes, which is why it's so effective for veterans. Because we are dealing with so many issues at the same time, a broad, you know, what, what I would refer to as a broad spectrum uh, therapeutic, like cannabis, is so effective. Because a lot of the, in, the issues that we're dealing with are, you know, uh, are co-occurring, as I said, and aggravating one another. So anything to provide that kind of relief is a massive, you know, will, uh, enables a massive improvement in a veteran's quality of life. So the VA Medicinal uh, Medical Marijuana Safe Harbor Act uh, would also uh, direct the VA to do another study on, uh, you know, op uh, veterans in pain and the relationship between, as it says, medical marijuana programs and a reduction in opioid use among veterans. Previously, uh, the National Institute for Drug Abuse has funded a, a couple studies in the last two years that have shown, spe looking specifically at Colorado, the reduction in opioid use, the reduction in opioid fatalities or op opioid-related fatalities, 
the reduction in opioid prescription, where, you know, since the legalization of uh, cannabis in that state. So the expectation is that the substitution effect will occur at an even far greater scale if you were to actually make cannabis easily accessible. But of course, Congress loves to uh, delay, so you know, we have to run through these hoops, at least at the moment. Well, hopefully our next president will uh, be far more uh, in favor of cannabis legalization. And, and looking at the democratic field, it's, it's a strong bet that uh, the next president will be the, will be the one that signs cannabis legalization into law. Which brings me to the last bill that I'm going to t speak on today, which is H.R. 1588, the Ending Feder Federal Marijuana Prohibition Act. Now, there's been several bills that have gone through Congress in the last few sessions that have all tried to basically tried to figure out what the best approach to, you know, legalizing cannabis is going to look like. In our, you know, professional opinion, this is the best route to go about. It's a clean D schedule, it, and it would essentially it would essentially uh, cement the protections that are already that you know protections that states already provide to their citizens and prevent federal uh, interventions in those in those instances. But I'm not going to go too much detail about that because uh, we have a far better expert to uh, to address that. So I'll leave you with a couple thoughts here. You know this I try to present this in as stark as terms as possible. Cannabis prohibition is killing Americans. Okay, every day. This delay, this deny, this wait for research, right? Again, 100,000 dead veterans in 18 years. This is not an issue that just gets better. And you can see that, you know, despite the fact that, uh, you, know, I'm a, you know, I'm at the tail end of the uh, millennial generation, Congresswoman as well, also a veteran, you know, at the tail end of uh, this generation. And we're now starting to deal with the impact of what, you know, 18 years in Iraq and Afghanistan look like. A lot of the impacts are not felt immediately. It takes, you know, there are, there are sometimes years of delay. And that's why, you know, the 18 to 34 suicide rate among male veterans is now something along the lines of uh, 1.5, you know, essentially, uh, you know, 150% above uh, their peers. So the anecdotal observational clinical evidence, right, it all points in the same direction. This is not a conversation that we need to have where we need to argue on the semantics. We, this is a very straightforward message that anyone who's in, interested in advocacy should be delivering on a regular basis. That this, is, that this prohibition, this delay is killing people. And to, and to deny that or to say that you care about veterans or that you care about the opioid epidemic, or that you care about any of these public health things or issue, you know, challenges or crises that are affecting millions of Americans every day, legalize cannabis. That's the answer. So thank you very much. Uh, some of our, uh, you know, uh, contact information, and uh, you can find us on all social media. So thank you for your time. And again, thank you for, to Luis and Ryan for, uh, for inviting me to speak. And I'm look for, looking forward to the keynote. Thank you.